Success. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to abandon you. So our uh, next speaker is Brett McGuire, who's going to be talking about the golf front. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so yeah, so today I'm excited to give everybody a uh, sort of an, an update on uh, results from the Gotham Project, which is a large project using the GBP, not just at K-Band, but at a bunch of different frequencies, um, and, and talk quite a bit in, in my talk about why K-Band in particular is so good for doing the kinds of molecular discovery studies that we're doing with the Gotham Project. I am one of two Gotham talks this week. Andrew will be talking Wednesday morning, I believe. Uh, so I've tried really hard to minimize the amount of overlap. So I'm gonna talk very little about the chemistry and really talk heavily about uh, what makes uh, the GBT and these frequencies perfect for this sort of science. And then talk a little bit about some of our very, very recent results. So today's talk is of course, all about detecting molecules in space using uh, the, the Green Bank Telescope. So here's all, it's now 268 actually, molecules detected outside our solar system. And I have highlighted here all of the molecules detected using Green Bank facilities. So the ones in blue are the ones detected for the first time using the 140 foot telescope. And the ones in red are those detected for the first time in space using the GBT. And Aside from the fact that there's a lot of them, right? What I want you to take away most from this is that they're all on the right side of this screen, which is ordered by number of atoms, right? The molecules detected here at Green Bank, particularly with the GBT, all tend to be very large molecules. And so I wanna spend the first part of the talk here talking about why that is from a molecular physics standpoint and why the GBT is such a good machine for doing that. So what I've done here on this plot is I've taken all of the molecules detected outside of our solar system, and I have made a kernel density estimate. It's essentially just a smoothed out histogram, right, of the uh, atomic mass of those molecules, and I've clumped them together by the wavelengths in which they were first detected. Right? So this is not, you can of course detect these molecules at many wavelengths, but these are the wavelengths where they were first detected, right? Very first time we saw them. And the trend here, at least to me, is really clear, especially when we look at the radio wavelengths, right? As you move from high frequency in the submillimeter to medium frequencies in the millimeter to low frequencies, long wavelengths in the centimeter, the average mass of molecules first detected at those wavelengths increases, right? As you move to longer and longer wavelengths to lower and lower frequencies, you detect heavier and heavier molecules. I'm going to show you a second plot here and talk about where in the sky we're finding these molecules, again, sorted by mass. Right? And the takeaway here right, is that if you look at the colors here, the heaviest molecules right, are exclusively found in dark clouds. Right? Intermediate ones found in carbon stars, places like IRC 10216, but the heaviest molecules, the largest molecules that we're finding, the ones we're finding with the GBT, are exclusively found in dark clouds. Right? So this is two takeaways from that uh, sort of semi-statistical analysis here, back in the envelope analysis, is that heavy molecules are found at low frequencies, and that heavy molecules are found in dark clouds. So I wanna talk about why heavy molecules are found at low frequencies, right? And why heavy molecules are found predominantly in dark clouds. What is it about that frequency range and that source that lends uh, to detections there for the first time? So we're gonna start with the first one. Why are heavy molecules seen at low frequencies? I'm gonna do that by walking through how we actually generate rotational spectra, the radio spectra that we look at for molecules. So here's the, the rotational spectrum of CO, right? Starting down at, 115.271 gigahertz down here. And moving on up, I've made it at 300 Kelvin here. As the only equation in the talk, some of you have seen this slide before, right? This is how we determine the rotational frequencies of a molecule. So the rotational frequency of a molecule is given by two times a rotational constant and then indexed by a quantum number. So J1 to zero, J2 to one, so on and so forth, moving on up. That rotational constant itself, is just a bunch of fundamental constants like Planck's constant and the speed of light and eight. Uh, and then the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of a molecule, if you remember back to freshman physics years ago, 
uh, is the uh, reduced mass of the molecule and the separation between those masses in the center of mass, right? So if we aggregate all of this back up, right? What does this tell us? Well, it tells us first why rotational spectra are so powerful, right? They're uniquely dependent on the structure of the molecule, right? They're dependent on where the masses are and how they're distributed in 3D space. If you change a single neutron, go from carbon 12 to carbon 13, the entire rotational spectrum shifts, right? So it is a unique molecular fingerprint. But even more importantly, in our case, right, we can think about what happens if we increase the reduced mass. We make the molecule larger. What happens? Well, if you increase the reduced mass, you increase the moment of inertia, you decrease the rotational constant, and the transition shift to lower frequencies. Right? So the heavier your molecule gets, the lower the frequencies of its fundamental rotational transitions. The entire spectrum just shifts down. And I'll show you some examples of that later. Right? Now, of course, there's outliers to this and things get more complicated as you go to two and three dimensional molecules, but the trend really does hold. The more mass, the more atoms you put into a molecule, the lower in general you are going to find its rotational transitions. So that's where the frequencies are. Right? And I think that explains that first observation that I put up, that first statistic, that we're seeing the heavier molecules at lower frequencies. So what about the second statistic, that we're seeing these in dark clouds? Right? Well, what is, at least as far as chemistry and physics go, the fundamental overriding principle of a dark cloud? It's cold. Right? These clouds are about 10 Kelvin or so, at least the places that we're looking. So what does temperature have to do with detecting molecules with GBT at low frequencies? Well, for that, we have to look at a little bit of uh, statistical mechanics here. Right? So I've blown up our CO spectrum here again that we're using, which I've put up at 300 Kelvin. And you can see that 300 Kelvin, the brightest transition falls up here to six, seven, 800 gigahertz, something like that, right? So why is that? Well, these are transitions that are seen in emission, right? We're looking at the emission of these molecules. So it's, Population that's moving from an excited electron, uh, higher lying rotational transition, uh, rotational energy level to a lower lying one and giving off that light. Right? So, what this means is at 300 Kelvin, right, we have enough energy in the system to populate high lying rotational energy levels. Right? You have enough energy to populate this is the one to zero, two to one, three to two, four, five, six, seven. So J equals seven to seven to six, right? There's enough energy at 300 Kelvin that that's the most populated level, right? And it's able to emit brightly and, and show us light at its 700 gigahertz, 800 gigahertz. But what happens if we're at 10 Kelvin? Well, for 10 Kelvin, there's almost no energy left over, right? The partition function collapses, right? And the most populated rotational energy levels are the really low energy species. I seem to have lost Zoom internet. So I am no longer screen sharing. This is me, yeah. Network connection fail. And can we run? We can, we can still see you, Brett. In the lecture, just can't see they're just a uh, distance, but we can't see them. Okay, we're gonna try a new uh, a new cable here. Stand here. Emergency tech support. All right, Ellie, just look short, and you're doing great. <laughs> as long as you don't pull my computer up, it's fine. All right, um, give me half a second to click the Zoom link. We, we will, if this works, we'll make it more stable in just a second. Success. Uh, not yet. <laughs> so I'm going to go back here. Stop. There you go. Oh, you're oh, back. Oh, we're back. Uh -oh. Go that. Go there. Go there. I'm back. Okay. Excellent. All right. So what happens to our, once we've reduced the temperature here, what happens to our spectrum? Well, the brightest lines now shift down to low frequencies because those are the rotational energy levels that are populated, right? So at 10 Kelvin, what we're seeing in these cold dark clouds is that the brightest transitions are no longer falling in the millimeter and the submillimeter. The brightest transitions fall 
at low frequencies because of the way the statistical mechanics and the energy levels work, right? So to me, that explains why both of these observations are seen, why the GBT in particular is so good at detecting large molecules, because large molecules are predominantly found in dark clouds that are cold, right? And large molecules have transitions at low frequencies. Both of these things favor the brightest lines, the strongest transitions, the most easily detected signals falling at the low frequencies, particularly as we'll see in K-band that the GBT excels at. <clears throat> so I want to detect new molecules in space. I love the GBT. It's the best thing for looking at uh, large molecules in cold, dark clouds. Um, so the largest molecules we're going to look at right, are these species. Right, outside of the fullerenes, buckyballs, C60, and C70, the largest molecules that we know are out there and are in need of study are these molecules. These are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And so these are very large uh, molecules composed of fused five and six membered rings that you just stack together in whatever combination you want. Right? Now, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, up to 25% of all of the carbon in the universe is locked up in these molecules. It could be as small as 3%. It could be more than 25%. I don't know. I, I, ask somebody else. Um, I'm just pulling numbers out of the, out of the literature. Um, but besides the fact that they're important carbon reservoirs for interstellar chemistry, we like carbon as chemists, right? They're still really important for a variety of other reasons. They can be the seeds of interstellar dust formation. They are the primary charge balance carriers in interstellar clouds. They're happy to take some extra uh, to give up some extra uh, electrons, right, and become positively charged cations to balance out the free floating electrons. Um, and they're even large enough at some point to become the surfaces to form molecular hydrogen, right? So aggregate some hyd hydrogen atoms on there, bring them together to make molecules. Despite that, though, our knowledge of the chemistry of these molecules in space has until very recently been quite limited. And that's because uh, this 25% number comes from our observations of these molecules, not in the radio, but in the infrared, right? So back in 1986, 1987, uh, these uh, uh, bright, ubiquitous, sharp, and distinct emission features in the infrared were discovered in many regions of our own galaxy, particularly places where intense UV radiation comes in. It excites a PAH molecule to a higher lying electronic state. And then those pH molecules give off the extra energy by radiating out through their infrared transitions. You can see these in our galaxy and a bunch of other galaxies as well. The problem though, is that if you look at this figure, right, this spectrum is not labeled with what molecules are giving rise to the signals, right? And that's because we can't tell what molecules are giving rise to these signals. We can only tell general patterns. Right? These are the frequencies that we associate with the vibrational modes of carbon and hydrogen atoms stretching and bending with respect to one another inside aromatic molecules in general as a class. Right? But it turns out that the stretching and bending, by bending vibrations of aromatic molecules, while distinct from one another, are all very similar. They're not as distinct as rotational spectra. And so while two PAHs are distinguishable in the laboratory, when you have dozens or maybe hundreds of different ones in an interstellar cloud all radiating out to you, it becomes one distinctive but inseparable mess. And so the analogy I like to use here, I'm, I'm trying a new analogy on you guys now, um, is if I set you down in a room and I give you an array of, what's this, 20 different people, Mm -hmm. And I have you listen to them sing a song at you, the same song, they're all going to sing it to you, right? And then I bring one of them back out, right? And I have them sing it to you, you can't see them, right? You can probably identify who was singing, because each person's singing voice is unique, right? However, if I put nine of them together in a choir, right, and make you listen to them from the other side of the room, blindfolded, you can't see them, you're probably going to have trouble picking out who from your group of 20 is actually singing, right? Each voice is unique. They're all singing the same song, and the tones are so similar that they overlap. Now, you can play some cool tricks with our emission spectra in the infrared. You can figure out the balance by looking at the, the relative intensities of different components, say, of charged versus neutral species, just like you could probably pick out whether I put in eight altos and one tenor, right, or a mix of the others, right, that sort of thing. So you can pick out some information that way. 
Rotational spectroscopy, though, is structure dependent. It's equivalent to just looking at the freaking faces of the people, right? Not listening to their songs at all and saying, oh, okay, it was Mando that was singing all along, right? That's what we want to do with rotational spectroscopy. That's what we want to do with radio astronomy is look at the structure of the molecules and figure out which ones are there specifically. So that's what we established the Gotham collaboration for. So like all good astronomy projects, Gotham is an acronym, GBT observations of TMC1, hunting aromatic molecules made out of actual data there. Right? So what is Gotham? Well, we started out actually as a pretty ragtag team of students and, and postdocs. Um, and, and many of us now are fortunate to have some, some junior faculty positions um, from a wide range of universities, uh, several different continents, and broken down largely into uh, three different... Tony, why are you grumbling? Your name's right there. <laughs> oh, it's because you, really you don't have the star for early career, I see. Um, uh, the three different areas of astrochemistry, observations, laboratory work, and modeling. And of course, uh, a lot of us span these, these different fields. Uh, so why are we looking at TMC1 in particular? Well, it turns out about one in three molecules now is detected for the first time in TMC1. In this singular source, about, uh, it's, I think it's up to 28% of all molecules known to humanity have been detected for the first time in this location. It's particularly good for detecting carbon molecules. Um, so I've circled TMC1 here in, in the constellation of Taurus. This is uh, imaged from my apartment complex in Charlottesville a few years ago. Um, it actually took the first place spot away from Sagittarius B2N in the Galactic Center about six months ago or something, overtook it for a number of detections. So with the GPT, we've been looking at this source and what have we been doing? Well, we've been doing a broadband spectral line survey. So we've now clocked, uh, the, the main projects have ended, uh, we've clocked over a thousand hours on the GPT doing an incredibly high resolution, high sensitivity broadband spectral line survey of the source. Um, so here I'm just showing a broad overview. Um, we are making the data publicly available as soon as we, it's finished being taken in a particular frequency chunk. Unfortunately, X-band was the only one that's gotten done so far uh, until uh, just last month. Um, so X-band is out. You can go download it from, um, from AppJ there in our supplemental information. And then uh, we finally finished all of the, the, the time allotted to us for KU-band, K-band, and KA-band uh, at the end of this last semester. Um, so hopefully sometime this spring, we'll finish the reduction on that. And you can go download that as well and play through it. So what have we seen with Gotham? We've seen an incredible array of new molecular species for the first time. So these are all of the molecules, barring one that I'll, I'll tell you about in a second, detected for the first time outside our solar system using this specific project, Gotham, on the GBT. Right? And they're roughly sorted here in size order. Right? Some very heavy ones over here, but a lot of other interesting species, um, including some isocyanides here, some interesting kinked and, and branched molecules, long chain hydrocarbons, uh, reconfirming HC11N in space after we disproved the previous one um, that was taken with, I think, 140 foot data originally, right? Yeah. Uh, but I do want to draw your attention to these down here at the bottom, right? And I will expand these out here and add one that was just accepted last week, right? These are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are the first polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons individually identified in space, right? Remember, we'd never detected a single one of these individually outside the solar system before. And we have all of these uh, four now from the Gotham project. Um, if you want to know about the chemistry of how these are formed and how we're doing with the modeling, I'm going to see Andrew's talk on Wednesday morning. I'm going to talk very little more about uh, the actual chemistry that we're learning from this, except for a little bit at the end, I think, on, on cyano. Maybe. Um, what I do want to spend the rest of my time, though, talking about is why the GBT is great for these detections in particular. And the answer to that and why K-band is, is great in particular is as we'll see, K-band is the perfect frequency. The GBT is incredibly sensitive. And when you back K-band up with something like Vegas that gives you the bandwidth and the resolution, you can actually get some pretty fantastic detections out of this. So let's look at each of these one at a time. Why is K-band perfect? Well, remember we worked out that as molecules get larger, right? Their transitions shift to lower and lower frequencies. 
Right, so here I predicted the spectra at 10 Kelvin for benzonitrile, the, the first molecule that kicked all of this off here. Uh, and you can see it's, it's hovering. Its strongest transition is right about at the upper end uh, of, of the KFPA here. Right? Our PAHs all start falling here in the middle of K band. Uh, and then as we try to move eventually to larger PAHs, those are going to shift even further down. So this is the perfect location to be looking at this size molecule. So rotational spectroscopy just works out. So the cave FPA is the right place to do it. If you combine that with the fact that the, uh, if you have good weather and the sensitivity of the receiver work out, it's much easier to get high signal to noise on these lines than it is anything else. So I think that uh, um, this is really highlighted. I don't have a slide to tell you this, but this is really highlighted when you compare our results to the results from uh, the Quixote team, Quixote survey team that's working on the Yevas 40 meter telescope in Spain. They're also looking at TMC1. They're looking at Q-band at higher frequencies, and they detect almost exclusively smaller molecules than us, right? And that's because those small molecules have their stronger transitions at higher frequencies. They're perfectly positioned for observations with that telescope at that frequency, whereas we're seeing the largest ones here at the lower frequencies. All right. So if we want to push further than this, right, this is just frequency. We also have to talk a little bit about the intensities of those lines and uh, really drilling down deep in sensitivity space. So not just is the KFPA at the right frequency, but it's the sensitivity of the GBT that lets us do this. So these are some of the lines from Gotham of benzonitrile on the left, which are, are now at fairly high signal to noise. And then our cyanonaphthalene lines here over on the right, which are detected, right? But they're really, really weak. So we needed to come up with some new strategies leveraging the bandwidth and the sensitivity and the resolution of the GBT and its instruments to get better signal to noise on these detections and really maximize the use of our data. And so what we're doing with that is taking advantage of the fact that we have such wide bandwidth, we cover so many different transitions that we're going to use a technique called spectral stacking. So what I'm going to show you here is an animation uh, of what we do based on benzonitrile. What we're going to do is we're going to cut out every line of benzonitrile from our spectra. We're going to center them at zero in velocity space, and then we're going to average them based on the signal to noise of that line. So upweight those that are bright and downweight those in high noise regions. And so I'll show you that this, as this plays through here, is we just average more and more lines. So each scan here contains one line of benzonitrile. You can see that, uh, as you would expect, the signal to noise ratio of the detection goes up. Now I've chosen to use this with benzonitrile because that was our, our first detection and you can actually see the lines starting out at the beginning, right? So we're just averaging more and more and more in here. And I think this will stop somewhere around 50, right? Just to be clear, these yes. are individual lines, not scans on the GPT. Right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the, 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 the name there is annoying, but I can't, I can't easily change it. Um, so we get a signal here, a very high signal, about 28.1 sigma after averaging 50 individual lines. Um, and then I can add in even more and get a, eke a few sigma out uh, further. But then we want to extract even more information from this signal because these lines contain velocity structure, right? You can integrate signal underneath this line, right? And in each channel that contains information. So we want to figure out what is the, the significance of our detection? What's the evidence that this molecule is actually there? I mean, it's there, right? But what's the statistical evidence for that? And so that what, what we're going to do is we're going to borrow a technique from the radar communities uh, that, that Ryan Loomis helped us put together. Uh, he did on protoplanetary disks to start with. And it's called spectral match filtering. So what we do is we just take our stack spectrum there and we take our uh, simulation of what that uh, spectrum should look like right, if we have properly simulated the column density and velocity structure in line with the line, and we just push it through as a filter, right, and get out what's called the impulse response function here, which is a, a measure of the actual significance of that detection, a, a degree to which uh, our model that the molecule is present agrees with the data. So in this case, 53 sigma, right, which one doesn't really doubt because it's a very bright line and we can see the individual lines. Right? But it does really help when we look at these PAHs, right? So you saw all those individual small lines of the cyanonaphthalene that I showed you before that were at three or four, maybe one of them was at five sigma. But when you stack them all together and include dozens of them, right, 
you get a higher signal to noise response in the stack and you can actually see that there's 13 and a half sigmas evidence for the presence of this molecule in the data. And this is only possible because we have the broad bandwidth of the KFPA combined with Vegas that allows us to get these dozens of different lines simultaneously sometimes uh, to stack them all together. So I want to spend the last few minutes here, and I'm not going to steal much of your thunder, Andrew, don't worry, uh, talking about um, uh, the results, what we've learned from this most recent round of detections of PAH, is specifically the one that we published last week. Uh, and to do that, I have to first discuss a little bit uh, about our chemical modeling efforts, uh, which Andrew will go far more uh, into far more detail about. Um, we heard a little bit about chemical models earlier today, but I want to break down what they are. They, they consist of two parts. Um, the first is a network of about a thousand molecules or so of order uh, and tens of thousands of reactions between them. Basically take every molecule we could potentially believe could be interacting in the chemistry in this source and every reaction between them, including the rates of those reactions, the energetic requirements of those reactions, the temperature dependence and density dependence, if we know it, right? Put them into this grand ensemble, which makes up thousands of different rate equations and then ask the computer to solve those rate equations with time, right? By applying the model, which provides the underlying physical conditions, right? What's the temperature of the source, the density of the source? How does that change over time as say a star turns on, which we don't model because it's a cold dark cloud, right? But one can. Um, and then the output is an abundance of all of your molecules versus time. And ideally, if you have modeled the chemistry correctly, if you understand how those reactions work, your model should reproduce the abundances that you see, right? That would be great. So here's the output, forgot I don't have wireless, uh, of our model for the PAHs versus time. So here's uh, benzonitrile, right? single ring, and cyanonaphthalene, the double ring. Um, and there's the observations. So we're only off by six orders of magnitude. Great, right? Um, that's actually not surprising because we haven't tried to study these molecules before because we never had the individual detections of PAHs, right? We had to start completely from scratch. Poor Cece and Andrew <laughs> and Alex have been adding reactions meticulously to the network, which is a huge endeavor, a huge time sink. But as they do it, this is our first guess. Look, we're improving, right? As time goes on, we're still wrong, right? But that's okay. Right? We're learning things about the chemistry as we improve and move along. We're off on the absolute abundances, right? but things are getting better. And Andrew will tell us how they are getting better on Wednesday, I believe. Um, I'm not going to talk much about what we've done to, uh, to work on these absolute abundances. But what I do want to talk about is what the most recent detection of the cyanoindine here that I showed you earlier, right? tells us uh, about our understanding of the chemistry. And in particular, what I've done is I've grouped the molecules here by uh, the CN tag, so put a CN instead of a hydrogen, versus the pure hydrocarbon version of each molecule. And if I put up which molecules we have detections of, right? Well, we have detections of benzonitrile and the cyanonaphthalene, but we can't see naphthalene or benzene, the underlying precursors there. They're completely symmetric, so they don't have rotational spectra. Right? But we do have detections now of cyanoindine and indine, actual PAHs here, and then these five-membered rings, which are, are probably slightly related at least, and their hydrocarbon precursor cyclopentadiene. So first, what I want to plot off is the ratio of the CN tag to the hydrocarbon tag version that our models predict. Right? So here it is. Right? It's a pretty steady abundance for all of these different species. And that's because we think the primary way that you make a CN tagged version from a hydrocarbon version is you bring the hydrocarbon in and you bring a CN in, you click them together and eliminate a hydrogen. It's that simple, right? And that's the primary way that we make most of these molecules in the model. And so the ratios are pretty consistent. Now we overplot our observations, right? The observations are pretty darn close, right? There's still not perfect agreement for all of these, but this isn't six orders of magnitude wrong. This is a factor of two or three wrong, right? That's much better, right? 
So that tells us that we have actually gotten a handle on one piece of chemistry, right? That CN plus hydrocarbon reaction probably is really, really important, right? It's probably one of, if not the predominant pathway to forming those. So that's nice information. But additional information is that actually we can probably now with some reliability. Yeah. Oh, we're still, we're still on this one. Um, can you mute, please? Maybe. Uh, we can probably infer the abundance of that underlying benzene and naphthalene that are invisible to radio astronomy with, with some confidence, at least within a factor of two to three, right, from our observations, which is great. That lets us constrain what's going on in the model. Um, so I'll just point out two things here, or a couple of things. One, you'll notice the, the benzonitrile. Uh, yeah, until we can take the plants, and then we can come back the following week or the 27th. Oh, it's J. Uh, yeah. Which is the. Sorry, that's a No worries. Um, so this, this point's a little different, just a point of interest. This actually has a, a reaction rate that was measured in the laboratory by, by one of our uh, Gotham team members, which is great. So it's a little more accurate. So maybe these need to come up a little bit. Um, <coughs> these have the standard. Oh, I lost my clicker. There we go. Because uh, these down here are the standard values in the model. Um, so that allows us, that's what I said there on the takeaways. And then I will note that I haven't, we haven't yet distinguished the isomers, right, of the, the cyanoindine here. So there's different places you can put that CN. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the last five minutes uh, and try to end on time here, um, is why do we only see one isomer of cyanoindine, right? So here's the indine molecule, right? And we see the version with the CN tagged off here in the two spot. But why can't you have the CN tagged off here in the one spot, the three, four, five, six, or seven, right? And you can, in fact. Um, they're just less stable, less energetically favorable, right? So you do some quantum chemical calculations. You can find that each one of these is higher in energy than the two position. And, and the one position here is heavily disfavored, right? Now, it tends to be in space that the lowest energy isomer often is the one that is seen, but that's not always the case, right? It's certainly not the rule. Kinetics and chemistry will dominate. So it's important to understand why we see the isomer that we do. Is it just because it's the lowest energy or is there something else going on? So the rotational spectra of cyanoindine were not known. We had to measure them in the laboratory. So that gave us an, op uh, an opportunity to see if we could make these other isomers in the laboratory as well. And we could, we could make all but two of them we saw in the laboratory and we made them with about equal abundance, right? So we saw the two, four, five, six, and seven with about equal abundance. So why don't we see these other two? What can we learn about the chemistry of this PAH now that we see it? Well, it turns out if you remember, for those of you that took undergraduate organic chemistry, if you want to react with an aromatic molecule and bring something in, you wanna do it at a carbon atom that has a double bond. It's just much more chemically favorable. And so over here, this site is incredibly disfavored to the addition of anything to the ring because there's not a double bond there to, to stabilize the, the electrons there. That doesn't explain why we don't see this three here because there's a double bond there to work with. And I think it's really cool here to think about uh, why we don't see this three position in the laboratory or, or in space. So here's the general way that you add a CN to this indine molecule hmm, to our reaction. You bring in the CN, Right? And you temporarily form this intermediate complex. So here I brought it in on the two position where the double bond is now gone. One of the electrons has been used to bond that CN and the other electron exists as a radical on this site down here. And then eventually you eliminate this hydrogen right, as a radical and everything gets stable again. But there's something really special about the two position attack and about most of these other position attacks. And that's because it forms what's called a resonance stabilized radical intermediate. And so this radical here, this one electron that's floating out here, you could equivalently draw this structure by taking one of the electrons from this double bond and that radical and making a double bond here instead. and putting the radical now up here at the top. Looks like that. These are identical molecules, right? There's nothing different about the electronic structure. They're just fine. You can also move that electron around to this position or to this position. Right? And again, from undergraduate organic chemistry, what this does is it causes stability to the system. 
right? If the electrons can float around this double bond system, they're being stabilized by the delocalized electrons in these double bonds, by this pi cloud here. The more resonance structures you can draw, the more stable the intermediate is. So that works for addition here, works for addition here, 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 here. But what about if you put the CN here? If you put the CN here, the only place that radical can go is to be stranded out here. And there's no way for it to then form double bonds anywhere. So if you try to put this radical here and put a double bond here, you have too many bonds to this carbon or too many bonds to that carbon. There's only one structure for this molecule. It's not resonance stabilized. So attack at this three position down here is highly disfavored by the chemistry. So we think that explains why we don't see it in the laboratory to not saying this here. And in space, our upper limits aren't quite constraining enough to say that we don't see these. We know nothing about these because we can't make them in the lab to measure the rotational energy spectrum, right? But in any case, we're really excited because this, again, is detailed chemical knowledge that we're gaining about the way that these reactions occur. And what we learn about this molecule from having this specific pair now is translatable to all other aromatic species. We can now look at those res the existence of those resonant stabilized intermediates and predict whether or not a particular pH is going to be strongly favored for production in space, whether it will be a good target to look for. So just to, to, to wrap up here again, right? I've shown you why uh, the GBT and the KFP in particular uh, fall in the perfect frequency region for looking at these large molecules. I hope I've convinced you that the sensitivity and bandwidth and resolution of the GBT, Vegas, and, and the KFP in particular help us detect these and detect them at high significance because we can see all of the different molecules. Um, and, and I hope that this continues on further. So in that final thought, what's next, right? At least for us, I want to make the statement that science for us scales linearly with bandwidth. Right? We can't make the dish bigger. Right? We're not going to make it more sensitive. What we can do is look at more lines. Right? So broadband capabilities are what are really important in high spectral resolution. And they really can turn large projects into small proposals, relatively small. So Gotham took 1,000 hours. Right? It takes us about 10 spectral settings per frequency window, per observing band. It takes us spend 10 spectral settings to cover the, the, the K band. Right? If we could do it all at once, that's a factor of 100 in observing time back, right? A factor of 10 in observing time back, right? Which takes a thousand hour proposal into a 100 hour project, right? So we could repeat this on other sources much more rapidly. We could expand our frequency coverage and sensitivity on Gotham and detect more molecules. Um, so please build 10 more Vegases <laughs> and put them on the instrument. That would be lovely. Um, so I'll end by uh, acknowledging my new. Uh, group at MIT, all of whom except Gabby are, are here. So please say hello and introduce yourselves to them uh, if you don't know them already. Um, and uh, happy to take any questions you might have. And it's lunchtime. Thanks. So we can take a question for Brett and uh, Renly. Let me know if anybody online has a question to talk to. Yeah. Did you stack the spectrum of different isomers to get an aggregate stack? You could attempt to do that. Um, you're going to suffer by the, by the fact that uh, your prediction, your prior knowledge of what the ratio of the isomer should be is not correct, right? So you have to make the assumption, well, you have to make an assumption. Are they all equal? Right. Or do you stack them by relative uh, energetics? which is probably not defensible, um, but some people would do. Um, just or you can choose something else. Just the analysis that, uh, you know, that's the Glendon, yep. all of this 13 carbon. Yep. You just stack them all together. Yep. Uh, I've attempted to do that for 13 benzonitrile substitution positions right. um, and had some preliminary indications. But the uh, at that point, we need a, a real statistician, a real Bayesian modeler to, to tell us what we've, what we've done right and wrong, I think. Probably doesn't, probably doesn't scale just from spectra. You can't stack spectra. You should not, yeah, you should be very careful about stacking molecules like you do spectra. Because right. when you stack the spectra of one molecule from the quantum mechanics and the statistical mechanics, you have very good priors on what your stacking weights should be. When you're stacking different molecules, if they're detected, if you can see the individual lines, it's right. fine, right? But 
if they're not detected, it's much harder. Okay. Any other questions before we head out to lunch? Does, when you're stacking, does it make any difference if the observations are not at the same time? Nope. Because the, uh, well, at least for TMC1, they're not evolving on the time scale that that matters. Um, what can matter, so, so we can, and we do, stack observations across the frequency spectrum that we cover. So all the way down to the bottom of X band, all the way up to the top of, of or middle of KA band. And the number of points across the line in velocity space does change. So we actually lose a little bit of information because we have to downsample the higher resolution stuff to the lower resolution stuff. Um, so it's probably a little, little lower significance than what's actually there, but it's just a consequence of we can't get higher resolution off of, off of Vegas without sacrificing bandwidth at that point. Got an we question. have Yancy first and then Sure. Yancy? Yeah, hey, Brett, thanks for the talk. I got a quick question about the hyperfine structure of these things. Those electric quadrupole moments respond to a strong electric field gradient, and these yeah. nitrogens are hanging way out on the end of the molecule. So have you been able to see any evidence of that in your when you try to do this match spatial filtering? Do you try to take that into account, or is it all just the velocity structure and it's lost in there? Yeah, no, so the, the hyperfine structure is resolvable for almost all of our species. The nitrogen hyperfine structure is. Um, it actually makes it a little annoying to stack um, because one has to, to be careful a little bit. One doesn't double count hyperfine lines when they're too close to one another. Um, but we do have ways to, to avoid that. Um, and what we do is we just end up stacking the entire feature rather than each individual component um, when, the, when they're inseparable. But we see them for almost any CN tag molecule. We can see the hyperfine in at least most of the transitions. Yeah. And honey? Uh, hi, um, I have a question regarding the modeling. So in your case, when you have the chemical models that, that you're mm -hmm. trying to match with observations, they are assuming a closed box, right? So you just, you just have a box of material and you evolve it, but you don't bring anything new to it. We, right? we have made one attempt to simulate some injection of top-down material from a, prior, uh, from a prior phase of stars. But even that is injected into the box at the beginning of the simulation, and we do not add any more mass after year zero. Yeah, but what would be uh, what would be the effect if you are constantly adding like adding mass adding fresh in. material? Yes. Uh, Andrew, do you want to or Cece, either of you want to make a speculation? Uh, or should I wait until Wednesday? Uh, <laughs> I will not talk about that on Wednesday. Uh, uh, I would have to say. It is possible. Uh, probably the way we simulate that is like increasing the density and the column density over the function of time, probably. Sure. Um, as of right now, we are keeping our models as static for the entire uh, simulation for these. Yeah. Uh, primarily, that's part of the reason why models like TMC1 is because we tend to just assume it's, it's stationary and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a good thing to like think about going forward, especially if we start thinking about. The fact that this, you know, TMC1 does have, uh, it's got all these multiple velocity components and it's clearly not as iso, you know, isotropic throughout. So it, we're probably doing it, uh, you know, a disservice, but, you know, there's, there's limits to what we can do with uh, this model. Yeah. And if, if you asked me to speculate on, on the actual chemical impact of doing that, beyond, beyond just the mechanical impact in the model, uh, I think it would really depend on what you are choosing to inject. So, my understanding, and people are, can nod or, or change their heads, but when you start with elemental abundances, it takes TMC1 in the model something like 10,000 years at least to start making more complex molecules that go on to do chemistry, right? The, the really complex ones don't start turning on around till 10 to the four years or so in any real abundance. So if you were to inject elemental stuff, even in at that point, it probably would not have a huge impact on the larger molecules for, for quite some time. Um, if you were to inject more complex molecules uh, and accrete them uh, at that point, then that might alter the, the reactions a bit. So, so we, we, we do, for example, the one day you're talking about, we injected, for example, benzene just straight into the model and see what happened. And we saw that around again, 10 to the four years, it starts dropping off. And once you get to an age roughly of TMT1 age, uh, you go like it drops off enough that I think what we said was like you had to have almost the entire abundance of carbon locked into rings to be able to reproduce 
uh, what we observe in TMC1. Um, so the fall off just happens to standard molecular destruction. So it's a, it's a good question, but I, I think we have no no firm answers for you. Okay, with that, I think we should uh, thank this morning's speakers again. And, uh, <laughs>